This is brought to you by Maze Vault. Like and subscribe to get your notifications. Couldn't do it without you, need your full participation. Uh -huh. Can we give it back to the sharp appreciation? Uh -huh. Tune in daily, get your positive vibrations. Hey. Learn different words in your own native language. Learn being black ain't all about slavery. All about put slavery. that in the school book, hey. it's part of education. We need to rewrite it, need some better information. Like how we built the pyramids and formed our own nation. British different continents and then try to invade it. Way before Columbus, but that ain't none of these pages. It's all just rumors, just a bunch of speculation. But why in every myth, every hero is Caucasian. Even white people starting to say this shit is racist. Like how they talking to blacks, but it's vaccination. This is Major TV, and this is brought to you by Maze. Like and subscribe to get your notifications. Do it without you, need your full participation. Can we give it back? This is our appreciation. This is Major TV, and this is brought to you by Maze. Like and subscribe to get your notifications. Do it without you, need your full participation. Can we give it back? This is our appreciation. Appreciate the views and appreciate the comments. Keeping it real, always giving you this content Hoping that my people don't take nothing out of context Giving you this knowledge, hoping that it change your mindset Telling you you're beautiful like the dawn of the sunset And letting them know black power is more than just a concept Major TV, you know we do this for the people Changing the community and raising future leaders This is Major TV, and this is brought to you by Major like and subscribe to get your notifications Couldn't do it without you need your full participation Can we give it back just to show our appreciation This is Major TV and this is brought to you by Major Like and subscribe to get your notifications Couldn't do it without you need your full participation Can we give it back just to show our appreciation Father, my bridge, and good day to you all. This is a major, and thank you for tuning in, Major TV. Let's talk. This is a very, very special day um, for Major TV. The person we bring in on this platform, um, I remember seeing him, I, I won't believe, like eight, nine years ago. And everybody know I'm a truck driver by trade. And I used to like find videos to keep me going. Um, lectures and whatnot to just, I guess, keep me sound minded in, in, in our struggles to know more about ourselves and be better as a people. And I ran across um, a renowned historian, Robin Walker, aka Black History Man. He's known as, and um, I seen a bunch of his videos. Um, I was privy to look at some of his books. I found that you know I wasn't familiar with UK and the history of um, black people in the UK. And thanks to Jim Lee, um, a friend I met via through social media, what I had started when I started Major TV, and um, I didn't even know she knew Robin, but um, I was very very um, touched and inspired to know that. We had people everywhere in the, everywhere in the diaspora. And, and, and Robin is based in the UK. And if you not know, you don't know about him, um, you definitely need to go check out historian Robin Walker, aka Black Man, Black, the Black History Man, and, and, and really check him out. Very articulate, very intelligent, um, have a vast amount of education. Um, I've heard stories where he he have actually challenged the British Museum and stuff like that. And just really, um, as a comrade among many great historians like Dr. Diop, um, Dr. John Jackson, Dr. John Henry Clark, 
I mean, Dr. Small, a bunch of um, um, late and current historians. But today, um, I asked them via through um, and generally to have them come on a platform, do a presentation, and then a Q&A. And I just want to thank him first and foremost for coming to the platform. And apologies, I really want to thank everybody viewing. Um, please like and share this live. Please like and share this live. We have a very, very special broadcast with a very, very special, special person. And I really um, want to want to thank everybody for, for taking the time out and listen with this with this this, this powerful brother to say. I mean, words alone can't describe um, the lectures he had, he, um, the interviews he did in several successful books. I have a few on right here, um, right here. Um, Blacks, Signs in Volume One. He has several volumes of that. Um, I have another book, was really a study guide, but I have a few more books coming in. But um, it's so much we're gonna get into. But um, without further ado, I definitely want to bring this brother on. I want him to do a presentation, presentation first, and then we're gonna go into the actual um, Q and A. Peace and peace and blessings, brother. How you doing? I'm doing very, very well, sir. Glad to okay. be on your show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Without further ado, I have some people watching and what have you. Um, it will probably pick up throughout um, this presentation. I'm gonna let you go into your presentation, sir, and I'm gonna I'm go in backstage. Okay, could you put my uh, presentation on the screen? All right, thank you very much. All right, greetings, 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 greetings. I'm representing a company called the Black Secret Education Project, and we are quietly empowering the people. The presentation is called Changing the Game, New Developments in Black History and African Heritage. All right, so why are we here? Well, I have to thank Major TV, uh, Major Davis, for giving me some space to uh, share my knowledge, share what I do with the uh, people watching, with the people online. So greetings to everybody. All right, so what are you gonna learn? You're going to learn empowering information on black or African history, detailed content that will expand your mind and ideas and concepts that will increase your personal effectiveness as you triumph your way through life. When people think of black history or African heritage, they think of the scholars I call the mighty handful. Five major scholars, Professor Sheikh and to Diop. Uh, we say Diop in the English speaking world, but French people have told me it's not pronounced, that's pronounced Jop. Uh, Professor John Henry Clark, Professor Chancellor James Williams, Professor Youssef Ben Yokanen, and Professor John Glover Jackson. Another brilliant body of work was produced by Professor Ivan Van Sertima and his students and colleagues and people surrounding him, people like um, Wayne Chandler, Runoka Rashidi, and Charles S. Finch. And they produced books such as The African Presence in Early Asia, The African Presence in Early Europe, The Golden Age of the Moor, They Came Before Columbus, Black Women in Antiquity, uh, Egypt Revisited, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, what happened was the two groups of scholars inspired the Portland Model Baseline Essays. And these essays allowed school teachers who were serious that they could radicalize American school teaching. And these essays have been around since 1987. In particular, an essay was written on art by Michael D. Harris, English by Joyce Braden Harris, uh, mathematics by Professor Beatrice Lumpkin, uh, science by Hunter Adams, social science, which is history in this case, by John Henry Clark, and music by Charshi Lawrence McIntyre. And it meant then that school teachers in American schools have the option of availing themselves of this information and using it in the classroom. So what I did was to radically update their findings and so Professor John Henry Clark's findings that provided the basis for history. I wrote a book called When We Ruled. 
and then Lompkin's findings that made the basis for how you could Africanize mathematics. I wrote a book called African Mathematics. Uh, Hunter Adams's work that revolutionized how science teaching and technology teaching can happen. Well, I wrote Blacks and Science Volumes 1, 2, and 3. I also wrote about how religion and how its teaching could be revolutionized with Blacks and Religion Volumes 1 and 2 and updating um, uh, the work that's already been done on literature teaching and music teaching, I wrote The Black Musical Tradition and Early Black Literature. So what's since happened is the information was in book form. One of my teams created something called The Black Secret Education Project, and we are calling this the finest black history course online where you really can get an in-depth understanding of ancient African history, medieval African history, modern African history, black history in the Americas, black history in Europe, black history in Asia. In other words, this is a very, very detailed and powerful course. Now, our idea is the black secret is a fundamental empowerment empowerment concept. We call it quietly educating the people. That's what we do. And we want to produce adults who can move themselves forward and the community forward. And we want to engage African people, uh, people of African heritage all over the world. You could be in London, you could be in Toxteth, Harlem, Kingston, Atlanta, Abuja, Nairobi, Accra, we want to engage you, and we want to engage you in two ways. Firstly, through the Black Secret Education Project, and secondly, through the Black Secret Business Project. So why do we call it the Black Secret? How do we choose that name? Well, secrets empower those who know and disempower those who don't. Unfortunately, black history is still kept a secret, but there are people outside of our communities who know our heritage, but have kept it quiet to empower themselves. Interestingly, the secret revealed principles of self-empowerment to the masses. Consequently, what we're doing, the black secret reveals empowering information on black history and African heritage with the ultimate aim of empowering people, not just through the Black Secret Education Project, which is the When We Ruled History course, but also through the Black Secret Business Project. So the contents of the course then is based on the book, When We Ruled. And ultimately, as we unveil our program, we will reveal what we do in five phases over the next 18 months. The phase one is already live, which focuses on medieval African history and heritage. Phase two will focus on ancient African history and heritage. Phase three will focus on global black people over the last 500 years. Phase four is the business project. We want to engage enterprising people who want to sell what we do as affiliates and make money, you can do that. And subsequent phases will cover everything uh, that we developed in the Portland Model Baseline Essays and the updates. So it will cover Africans in the history and evolution of mathematics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, music and literature, art and architecture, business and entrepreneurship, and great thinkers in the social science. Ultimately, we want, in an ideal situation, one million African heritage homes all over the world to subscribe to our program. We want every African heritage university to subscribe to our program. We want entrepreneurial people to sell our program as affiliates. And imagine what one million empowered households could achieve. So the question now is, is what's new in African heritage. And this is the main theme of the presentation, what's new. Now, what do I mean by new? I mean information that we now know about black history and African heritage that wasn't available during the time of Professor Sheikh Anta Diop, wasn't available during the time of John Henry Clark, 
wasn't available during the time of Chancellor Williams, wasn't available during the time of John Glover Jackson, and wasn't available during the time of Yusef Ben Yochanan. That's what I mean by new. Now, the first question I want to address is why do so many people look down on African heritage? Why? In 1958, a German scholar called Jan Heinz Jan explained in a text called Muntu, he said, two essential cultural achievements were missing in the old Africa, however, architecture and writing. Now, the idea that Africa has little or no early architecture and little or no early writing, unfortunately, is still the mainstream perspective. And this is the basis on which other people look down on African heritage. Now, to his credit, Mr. Yarn partly atoned for his false statements when he issued a book in 1961 called Neo-African Literature. Uh, that book is a classic, and that's how I was able to update the history of Black people in literature using his book. But the idea still persists. Africa, no architecture, no writing. All right, the Cathedral of the Granite Columns, you can see it's in ruins, was built in the 7th century AD. 7th century means 600 and something AD. And it was the most important religious building in medieval Nubia. Nubia on a modern map is where the country called Sudan is today. And the 7th century, 600 and something, this is a structure that was built 900 years before England's St. Paul's Cathedral. Some of you would have seen that in the news uh, over the last couple of days. So this is something built 900 years before that. Now, the archaeologists found the capitals from the Cathedral of the Granite Columns. The capitals would be the bits where you've got the column, and then the bit on top of the column is the capital. And that's part of the load bearing structure. Now, the Polish archaeologists published a reconstruction of if you put all the bits of the cathedral together, what would it look like? And you can see the front cover of the book called Dongolo 2. The cathedral in old Dongolo and its antecedents. Now, can you see the, the, the columns, the round arches? Did we know that this is how Africans were building in 600 and something AD? Not only that, window grills from the Cathedral of the Granite Columns have been found, including window glass. And window glass was found at the site of Old Dongola, where this cathedral was, and also at another ancient Sudanese city called Hambu Kol. So this notion then of window glass, 600 and something AD, this is already changing the game. Now, the capital city of the uh, medieval Nubians was Old Dongola. And from the 7th to the 9th centuries AD, high status houses were built. And a scholar called Jacob Bielski tells us what was there. And we read, further northwards, extend an 8th to 9th century housing complex. This is between 700 AD and 900 AD. Let's read on. The houses discovered here differ in their hitherto unencountered spatial layout, as well as their functional program. And then he's put in brackets. Water supply installation, bathrooms with heating system, and interiors decorated with murals. Water supply installations? Bathrooms with heating systems? What on earth? This is 700 to 900 AD. How comes no one's talking about this? Now, you can tell Jacob Bielski, this is another Polish uh, academic. They know about this information. Did you know about this information? All right, so let's look at our map. You can see the blue arrow pointing to Old Dongola. And this is one of the three medieval Nubian kingdoms, Nobadia, Makuria, and Alwa. And Old Dongola is the capital of Makuria. Another important city in Nobadia was Faras. And Faras is important to us because the archaeologists in the 20th century 
discovered the ruins of the cathedral and took some of these photographs which I've reproduced. Since then, the cathedral has been scattered to the four winds. Um, bits of it are in Poland, bits of it are in London. I'm going to show you a bit of it that's in London in a minute. But when they did the excavations, they looked through the documents, they found that this monument was built in 707 AD, 8th century. And this is what's in London. This is in the British Museum. That's one of the capitals from the columns. Again, you've got your columns, you've got your capitals. So that's in a London museum, and no doubt bits of the, of the, the monument have been spread out across the world, depending on which museum has taken in the artifacts. So what does it look like constructed? Well, this is what the Polish archaeologists have put out there. This is the lower structure of the cathedral, where you can see the, the columns, you can see the round arches. And here we've got the upper structure, and you can see that it's essentially a square building with a round dome at the top and then a cross above the dome. And then when we look at the full model, you can see what this would have looked like. This is what Africans were building in 707 AD. All right, now we're going to move from East Africa, Sudan, to West Africa. In West Africa was an empire called the Songhai Empire. West Africans have told me that they prefer to pronounce it Shongai, but we're going to use Songhai as we're more familiar with that. And this was a, a powerful super state ruling a huge swathe of West Africa. And the center part of it is the modern country that we would today call Mali. Now, on the map, you can see a city called Gao. And Gao was the capital city of the Songhai Empire. So what did the archaeologists find? Dr. Tim Insull of Cambridge University recovered an artifact in 1993 excavation, and it was then put on display at the British Museum. Let's read what the caption to this uh, uh, artifact, what did it say? Fragments of alabaster window surrounds and a piece of pink window glass. Gao, 10th to 14th centuries. 10th century is 900 and something AD. 14th century is 1300 and something. So at some point between 900 and 1400, the city of Gao had glass windows. And that raises the question, how many other cities in the world at this time could boast that its buildings had glass windows? Here's a, a, a panorama of the West African city of Timbuktu. And you can see the Grand Mosque of Timbuktu, the Jingwedabira Mosque, built in 1326 during the time of Mansa Musa I. Now, the Jingwedabira Mosque, can you see it looks like a castle? You can see the battlements. It looks like a castle. It looks like a fortress. And the idea of castles in West Africa tends to blow people's minds. But here you can see it, 1326. And can you also see the medieval houses of Timbuktu? They're still there. And they are of two and three stories. But the full development of West African architecture a style of architecture that the archaeologists, the academics, they call Western Sudanic architecture, is the city of Jene. And again, this is all centered where modern Mali is. You can see the 15th and 16th century houses, again, two and three stories. And you can see the central structure. And that began life in the 11th century as a palace. It was converted into a mosque. Uh, one of the rulers, his name was Khoi Komboro, he converted to Islam, uh, and in 1204, the palace was rededicated as a mosque. It's been built, rebuilt, built, rebuilt, but essentially what you're looking at is 11th century castle architecture or 13th century mosque architecture. And what's happened with that building is the Malians are really, really proud of that building. And so there's models of it 
in the uh, uh, Bamako Museum Park. I took those photographs. Now, did I mention that Genet had 15th and 16th century three, two and three story houses? Did I mention that? Well, this is taken from an architecture, uh, architectural drawing by a scholar called uh, Mars. And you can see we've got the uh, ground floor, second floor and rooftop terrace. And on the rooftop ter terrace, you can see that there's a room called a salanga. And that is latrine. That is toilet. So 16th and 15th century houses in Gene had toilets. Are we feeling this? Now, while we are still in ignorance of our history, this is what others are doing with our heritage, with my heritage, with your heritage. This is what other people are doing with it. This monument is called the Misiri Mosque, and it's in Frejus, it's in France. It was built in 1930, and you can see it's a stylistic replica of the Grand Mosque of Gene the same building bit that began life as an 11th century palace. This is now in Florida. Uh, it's called the Timbuktu Theater. And if you look at its design, you can tell that it's influenced by, again, the Grand Mosque of Gene. Here we have the Crocodile Park in Torremolinos in Spain. So here you have a third monument, which is a replica of the Grand Mosque of Gene. And finally, we have the Museum of African Art, Jeju-do, South Korea, which is another replica of the uh, Grand Mosque of Gene. Now, let me explain this building. Uh, Africans used to trade uh, with the Far East, and the result is that South Korea has a lot of African-made artifacts. So somebody in Korea had the idea that perhaps a museum should be built to house these artifacts and perhaps a, a museum should be built looking like an African monument. And so somebody had the idea that perhaps it should look like the great iconic monument in West Africa, the, the, the Palace of Gene, that's now become the Grand Mosque of Gene. And that raises a powerful question. Aren't you embarrassed that there are people in South Korea who know more about your heritage than you do. Let that sink in. Let it take as much time as it needs to sink in. All right, keeping it moving. Where next? Where are we going to go next? All right, we're going to go to this place here. Um, can you see uh, where my um, cursor's moving? I don't know if you can see it, but there's a place called Mossy. And Mossi was a set of seven kingdoms, and Mossi was to the south of the grand empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. And what happened was a spy from France visited the lands of the Mossi, which is Burkina Faso on a modern map, and the lands of Kong, which is Cote d'Ivoire on a modern map. And he went there armed with a sketch pen, documenting that was there. So you can see here a castle among the Mossi. Another castle among the Mossi. Uh, you can see the castle walls here, and you can see the city spreading out behind the castle walls. You can see the round uh, battlements and that kind of thing. Now, if I was to show this image to anybody around the world, the last place they would have guessed is this would have been West Africa. And this is coming from a spies report, a reconnaissance report uh, in West Africa. You can see two and three story buildings. You can see this grand monument. Um, I'm assuming it looks like a mosque based on the, 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 the pyramidal uh, design. Uh, West African mosques have got this pyramid, the, the, those pyramidal uh, towers. Um, so we can assume that that's what that is. And this particular image, I'm glad you all sat down because this image, study it. It's a metallurgical factory in the land of the Mossi, Burkina Faso. And you can see African smelters, African metallurgists engaged in high 
um, uh, high technological activity. And um, the Mossy smelters were churning out something like 500 metric tons of iron per year. And let that sink in. All right. Now, where else? Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to move elsewhere in Africa. Can you see where it says Ashanti? Because the Ashantis, um, their civilization, where modern day Ghana is, you can see the capital city of Kumasi, and you can see that the houses in Kumasi, some of them are two stories, some of them are one story, um, and you can see it depicted in an 1817 book. Um, again, we can see two two-story houses on the left, uh, three one-story houses on the right. So we need to see then what's inside those houses. Uh, the scholar who wrote the book, his name was Thomas E. Bowditch, and he was there 1817. Let's read what he says. What surprised me most about the people of Kumasi and is not the least of the many circumstances deciding their great superiority over the generality of Negroes was the discovery that every house had its cloakie. Cloakie means sewer. And then we can infer what he means by this is toilet. Let's read on. Besides the common ones for the lower orders without the town. They were genuinely situated under a small archway in the most retired angle of the building, but not infrequently upstairs, within a separate room like a small closet, where the large hollow pillar also assists to support the upper story. The holes are of a small circumference, but dug to a surprising depth, and boiling water is daily poured down, which effectually prevents the least offence. So what we're being told here is they've got a toilet on the second floor. It's within its own room. And the reason Bowditch is describing it like this is he's, he's making this intelligible to an English audience. Because, of course, in England in 1817, people didn't have indoor toilets. And the idea of putting an indoor toilet on the second floor and putting it within its own room this has to be explained to an English audience because they wouldn't know what he's talking about. And let that sink in. Now, here we have the royal palace of the Ashantis. And you can see, you can see the first floor, you can see the second floor, you can see the third floor. And it was built not by the Ashantis. It was built by another group of Africans called the Fantis. And the Fantis are another group of people within the, the, the confines of what we would today call modern Ghana. So the question I want to know is, what's inside the palace? I think we should take a look. When we look inside, um, a scholar called William Winwood Reed wrote about what was inside in his book, The Story of the Ashanti Campaign. So we get to the relevant page and we read, First, we went to the king's palace, which consists of many courtyards, each surrounded with alcoves and verandas, and having two gates or doors, so that each yard was a thoroughfare. These doors were secured by padlocks. An ordinary house has one courtyard, a large house three or four. The king's palace had ten or twelve. But the part of the palace fronting the street was a stone house, Moorish in its style such as those that are built at Cape Coast with a flat roof and a parapet and suites of apartments on the first floor. It was built by Fanti Masons many years ago. The rooms upstairs reminded me of Wardour Street. Now, for American listeners, Wardour Street is central London. There's a part of central London called Soho, and one of the streets there is called Wardour Street. Let's read on. Each was a perfect old curiosity shop, Books in many languages, bohemian glass, silver plate, old clocks, old furniture, Persian carpets, Kidderminster rugs, pictures and engravings, etc., etc. These are what was found. Are we feeling this? And is this challenging what you thought you knew about African history and heritage? Okay, the Swahili Confederation takes us to the East African coast 
where all the way along the coast from Somalia in the north, down through what is today Kenya, down through what is today Tanzania, down all the way to Mozambique is the lands of the Swahili. And the main Swahili cities were Mogadishu, today's Somalia coast, Malindi and Lamu, Kenyan coast, Mafia and Kilwa, Tanzanian coast, Sofala, Mozambique coast, and Sina, Mozambique inland. Now, the people who built these cities, the northerners, say where Somalia is today, they were called Berbers, and that means blacks. Uh, there's a source that we have written in 1352. The scholar's name is Ibn Battuta. He tells us that Berbers were a country of the blacks. And then he tells us there's a second population. By the time we get to the kind of Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, this population are called Zenj. And this is the basis of the word Zanzibar. Now, the Zenj, who are the Zenj? They are extremely black in complexion with tattoo marks cut into their faces. So there are two people on the East African coast, blacks and extremely black people with tattoo marks cut into their faces. And another name that covers all of them is the word Swahili, which basically is an Arab word meaning the coast. Now, what do the houses in Lamu look like? Well, this is the best preserved of the old Swahili cities. The houses were of one to three stories. I visited this site, and you can see that the interiors are extremely sophisticated. Uh, a modern, rich person today can live like that, and it still looks good. And this is how East Africans were going on in medieval times. At Gedi, I explored the palace, and I took these photographs, and what's there are the ruins of 54 rooms. All right, let me show you the plan. 54 rooms, 11 courtyards, 7 burial areas, and 6 double cubicle toilets. Now, did I just say toilets? What I've done here is I've blown up um, you know, you've got tourist guides, you know, like rough guide to Kenya. This is what the tourist guide says about that same place, the Royal Palace of Gedi. We read, the buildings were constructed of coral rag, coral lime and earth, and some have pictures incised into the plaster finish of their walls. Though many of these have deteriorated in recent years, the toilet facilities in the houses are particularly impressive generally in a double cubicle style with a squat toilet in one and a washstand in the other where a bowl would have been used. Fancier versions even have double wash basins with a bidet between them. Okay, so what do we learn then about African architecture? We saw castles. We saw cathedrals. We saw glass windows houses of two and three stories with um, toilets, some with toilets inside their own little room on the, the second floor. We saw bidets. Um, you can see then that this is changing the perspective of black history. You see, during the time of the mighty handful, you, you, people like Diop, Chancellor Williams, Jackson, um, during the time of these people, they didn't know that this kind of data exists because, of course, they didn't have access to this kind of data. We have access to this kind of data right now. So what do we know about early African writing? Professor Chancellor Williams uh, did a book called The Destruction of Black Civilization, where we read, in the Muslim destruction of the Songhai Empire, the main centers of learning with all their precious libraries and original manuscripts were destroyed first. Professor Sheikh Anta Diop in pre-colonial Black Africa wrote, the loss of the judicial and administrative archives, assistance of caddies, judges, kept minutes of the sessions, but tons of documents have disappeared. And so influenced by Professor Chancellor Williams and Professor Sheikh Anta Diop, 
Most black scholars believed that West Africa's intellectual heritage was mostly destroyed after 1591 uh, in uh, an apocalypse brought by the, 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 the uh, Arab Moroccans and their European um, forces. Um, and essentially, they destroyed what was in Timbuktu, they destroyed what was in Jene, they destroyed what was in Gao, and the result was uh, Africa's literature disappeared. And this is, this is still the mainstream view amongst a lot of black scholars. But a number of sources have forced us to make a paradigm shift. Professor Henry Louis Gates, uh, some, some people see Professor Gates as, you know, um, half-stepping. But the truth is, he's the person that did the most to tell the world that uh, Africa's uh, literature in places like Timbuktu still exists. Jeremy Isaacs uh, is the producer for a TV series called Millennium, 1000 Years of History. Again, mentions the Timbuktu manuscripts. John Snow and Echo Eshun did a documentary called Living on the Line, again, telling people about the heritage. And then BBC television made a, a one-hour documentary called The Lost Libraries of Timbuktu, presented by a West African woman called Aminata Forma, again, letting people know about the West African heritage. So what survived? Well, there are black families in Timbuktu that have 60 private libraries and Across the West Africa region, one million manuscripts may have survived despite floods, fire, insects, pillaging, and plunder. And here's an example. You can see this photograph of Mokhtar Sidi Yahya Elwangari. He's the director of a 16th century Timbuktu library owned by his ancestor. And his ancestor was the Timbuktu professor Mohammed Bagayogo Elwangari. So here I'm showing you astrology and astronomy manuscripts from the private Mama Haidara and Konate libraries. Uh, a manuscript on chemistry and pharmacopoeia. One is from the Mama Haidara library and the other is from the Ahmed Baba Institute. Uh, the great Timbuktu professor uh, Ahmed Baba um, He's got this manuscript, which the scholars are now calling Manuscript 776, and it includes the famous saying that on the day of judgment, the ink of the scholars will be measured against the blood of the martyrs and found to be weightier. In other words, be a scholar. And that's something that we should be telling every black uh, school child. You know, that's the most important thing. Yeah, the ink of you as a scholar. Manuscript 4056 is a physics paper on optics. And if you look in the top right hand corner of the page, you can see the reflection of light uh, being depicted. And what the paper describes are the properties and behavior of light and the interaction of light with matter. Manuscript 1756 is a commentary on law. It's an 816-page law text. Manuscript 86 is called The Keys to the Wings of Desire on the Knowledge of Arithmetic, and it's an 18th century text, but it's a copy of an earlier text. And it shows how arithmetic should be used to calculate the division of a deceased person's estate. Now, moving to East Africa, to Ethiopia, we read in a British conservative newspaper, The Telegraph, manuscript found in Ethiopian monastery could be the world's oldest illustrated Christian work. Now, what The Telegraph is telling us is if we're looking for early Christian art in manuscript form, in book form, the oldest example is in Ethiopia. There used to be a civilization there called Aksum, and there's an Aksumite manuscript called the Abba Garima Gospels, and it's the oldest example of an illustrated book uh, 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 associated with Christianity. So in other words, book art, illustrated book art of a Christian nature begins in East Africa in Aksum.
Now, some people have told me, but Robin, you have to admit that Ethiopia is just a cultural backwater that has contributed nothing to world culture. You have to admit that. My answer is, really? Let me show you this article. And the article was written by some Norwegian scholars. Yes, Norwegian. And this is what they say. I'm going to hop, skip, and jump across the article. It begins... The ideals of the Enlightenment are the basis of our democracies and universities in the 21st century. Belief in reason, science, skepticism, secularism and equality. In fact, no other era compares with the age of Enlightenment. Let me jump to the second paragraph. As the story usually goes, the Enlightenment began with René Descartes' Discourse on the Method, 1637. Continuing on through John Locke, Isaac Newton... David Hume, Voltaire, and Kant for about one and a half centuries, and ending with the French Revolution. Jump to the next paragraph. But what if this story is wrong? Now, that raises a question. What if the story of the Enlightenment, that wasn't the order? What if there were other people that were involved? Hmm. Let's read on. For two years until the death of the king in September 1632, Jacob, who's an Ethiopian philosopher, remained in the cave as a hermit, visiting only the nearby market to get food. In the cave, he developed his new rationalist philosophy. He believed in the supremacy of reason and that all humans, male and female, are created equal. He argued against slavery, critiqued all established religions and doctrines, and combined these views with a personal belief in a theistic creator, reasoning that the world's order makes that the most rational option. In short, many of the highest ideals of the later European Enlightenment had been conceived and summarized by one man working in an Ethiopian cave from 630 to 632. So according to the, the Norwegian uh, scholars who wrote this article, they're saying if we want to trace the Enlightenment, it doesn't go back to Descartes. It goes back to a gentleman in Ethiopia called Zera Jacob and his book, The Hatata, which means the inquiry, that is the beginnings of modern philosophy, not René Descartes. Let that sink in. Now, if we want to do more study on African writings, Portuguese influence in Central Africa led to the following in Congo. By 1516, the capital of Congo had 1,000 students studying grammar, humanities, and things of the faith. According to Professor Christopher Eret, that meant a local body of scribes was trained able eventually to communicate in written Latin, Portuguese, and Kikongo. So according to Christopher Eret, then, there may well be manuscripts in Congo that date back to the 1516 period. Um, some of them would be in Latin, some would be in Portuguese, some of them would be in Kikongo. And this is the result of the Portuguese influence in that region. However, one source, Giovanni Cavazzi, History and Description of the Three Kingdoms of Congo, Angola, and Matamba, 1687, claims that these kingdoms used hieroglyphics before the Portuguese arrived. That means that in the Congo region, where Angola is today and where um, um, a part of Congo is, there may even be hieroglyphic documents that we thought didn't exist, uh, may well exist. Okay, moving on, what else do we have? Uh, this is a book called A Miracle of St. Menas, and it's in the old Nubian script. Uh, this is medieval Nubia, um, and it's uh, the, the book, the binding, everything you're looking at is 1053 AD. So did we know then that the medieval Nubians had a script and they had a literature? This is a document in the Vai script, which was used in Sierra Leone and Liberia. Doesn't it look, look, look a little bit hieroglyphic-y? 
Um, and here is a document in the Bamun script of Cameroon. And we know that there are 7,000 manuscripts written in Bamun. And of course, someone needs to translate them so we can read them. All right, so some discussion points. What have been some of the new discoveries in African architecture? You see, we know a lot more than the mighty handful knew. You see, the game has moved on. What have been some of the new discoveries in African literature? You see, everyone thought that the only literature in Africa that survived is the ancient Egyptian. I'm showing you all kinds of new examples. And these findings have changed the game beyond where the mighty handful left it. All right, so let me draw a conclusion then. The Black Secret Education Project is the finest black history course online available all over the world at your um, convenience. You can access the data and the data consists of filmed classes. You can watch the film classes. You've got the PowerPoints, you've got the notes. So there's three reasons why we study our history, to confront limiting beliefs. Another reason is to build a team. You see, every person has to see value in other people from the community. And you put your value with their value. So you can work together, you can build together. And the only way you can see value in somebody else is when you know your shared history. And the third reason is so you have something to comfort this child. What black children feel like after being taught their ancestors were just slaves. See, everyone's pointing at the black boy. He's got his head bowed. He feels like nothing. You see, you can tell he came out of a class and everyone, the only thing that was being taught about him and his people is you were slaves. So when you learn your history, it makes you mentally stronger. After all, do you want to spend all your adult life living like this? Black people after work. Hope you like that graphic. All right, so what should you do next? If you're interested and you want to learn some heavy black history, you want to get on top of it, you want to master it, go to our site, www.theblacksecret.co.uk and subscribe, and it's £35 per month. But we do have a special offer. Special offer of £15 per month early bird. Uh, for American listeners, that's $20 per month. And it gives you access to all available content and all future content. But it's per month. All lessons are presented with convenient bite-sized chapters, downloadable content, including course notes and image slides. Um, and so you can also basically use the filmed lectures to teach yourself black history. And we also have a free gift, whether you join us or not. Um, there's uh, an ebook called 100 Black History Facts. Again, if you want the free ebook, 100 Black History Facts, uh, go to the site www.theblacksecret.co.uk and check us out. So, what have we learned about the first online Pan African teaching resource of Black history and African heritage available all over the world? Well, you're not going to come across content like this uh, anywhere else. And the new developments in African heritage, as much as I like, you know, your Diops, your Clarks, your Jacksons, your Williamses, and your Ben um, that was where the game was at. The game has moved on. We have more information now. And those are the new developments. And this is me changing the game, concluding the presentation. And I represent the company, The Black Secret, and we are quietly empowering the people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sir Robin. Appreciate that so much. Um, I had some questions I want to ask, and I'm definitely opening up um, this to the audience, um, the viewers, um, you all that's watching, you have any questions, any concerns? I think I think and Jim Lee had a question, but I mean, the comment with a question. But I have some questions. But after listening to you, it's so much I wanted to ask. But first and foremost, I want to 
thank you for just presenting something new as for us teaching our people about our history. And I really believe for the family, like a lot of time we complain about the school system and we complain about how we've been treated in reference to how the information has been disseminated. And here you started something that, that's very, very interesting. So first and foremost, what inspired us? When I found out that we have a history to be proud of, you see, like everybody else, I believe that we didn't have any history. Uh, I grew up on Roots, uh, the TV series Roots, uh, saw that as a child. And I thought, well, that's our history. We were slaves. And then I found out that uh, my chemicals professor, Chancellor Williams' book, I read it. I read it again. I read it again. I read it again. Um, and then as I did more research, I found out that Professor Williams's main point, we, we had a history, but the evidence has all been destroyed. That's why his book is called The Destruction of Black Civilization. I then found out the evidence wasn't all destroyed. And as I came to see more and more of the evidence, I realized, yes, a lot had been, but a lot is still there. Uh, a lot of monuments are still there. Um, a lot of, you know, ruins are still there. Then you've got all the fine art, uh, the craft pieces. Uh, I'm in London, so I've got access to the British Museum. Um, all the stolen stuff. Um, then I've also been to some of the museums in, in Europe, such as the, the uh, 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 Musée Qui Le Branle in um, um, Paris and saw even more stuff. So... The truth is, it, is it wasn't all destroyed. And when I realized this, I realized no one's talking about this stuff. And I realized I would have the market to myself. And I've been proved right. I do have the market to myself. Okay. Um, when, when, all right, let's, I have a couple. Let's talk about Chancellor William book, Destruction of Black Civilization, um, and, and, and reading it, right? He was concluding that this should be a case study of how great people was reduced down to either third class or, 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 or people that believed that they was following as opposed to leading being originators of everything. Um, do you think with the course you created, it, it, it actually answers some of those questions or uh, 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 talk about that? in a sense of realizing what he was trying to say in his book. Yeah, my book is partly based, when I wrote When We Ruled, it's partly based on Chancellor Williams. Because in every case, I don't just explain what we built. I explained why we lost it, step by step by step. And as you know, Professor Chancellor Williams is the only black scholar that explains how we lost it. The only one, the, you, you won't find any other scholar that has a systematic account of how we lost it. Now, Professor Williams' details in how we lost it, not all of them are correct, but they were right enough for someone that was writing in 1971, right? And what I've done is just simply update, 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 update. Um, but uh, as an account of how we lost it, he's right. He's absolutely right. And you won't be able to understand the difficulties that modern Africa is facing unless you address uh, Professor Chancellor Williams's findings. So yeah, the, the, the book is a masterpiece and my work is very, very much based on that work. All right, and I have two questions, but I, I wanna separate them. One, when I looked at um, when we ruled in the case study you did, this was for schools, right? No, no, no. no. When We Ruled was for adults uh, who wanted to read the, the book When We Ruled. Okay, okay. Uh, so the idea is, is um, When We Ruled, uh, depending on which edition you've got, it could be 700 pages, it could be 800 pages. Uh, for a lot of people, that's a lot to read. And so the point of the study guide was to break it down into two months worth of reading uh, two months worth of study and you can get through the book and the point of the study guide was to tell people that if you follow my guide after 15 days of reading which is two weeks and one day 
you will know, you will know more black history than 90% of people who claim to be knowledgeable in the area. And I stand by that. If people do, do the 15 days worth of reading, you really will know more black history than 90%. Um, so that's what that was for. That was for adults who are, are wanted to get through the book when we ruled. Since then, uh, adults now have another opportunity. The, the, the second opportunity is if reading a book is too hard going, then join the course. The course will give you the same content uh, and more. Do you see? So the, that's what the Black Secret's all about. Okay. And I know you said it was for adults, but I won't lie. The way you had put it together, it could, I, I, would, I wasn't thinking like that. This could be presented to um, something dealing with Black history as far as how you broke down the study guide what had about the book itself, right? So I kind of draw the inference from it. But moving to my next question, right? And D.R. book, The African Art and Civilization, right? He, he does something that that's amazing, right? And I, I believe that um, I believe it's either I think it's an introduction, if not chapter one. And I won't read them. I'm paraphrase. In, in, in this book, you know, you have a lot of pictures and stuff along with text. We specifically criticize any black historian who failed to connect Egypt to everything, as far as civilization and what have you. And we know for a long time, Europeans have made their business to make Egypt white and try to justify our detection, everything that went on in Rome and, and so forth so on. And he said if a black historian fell connecting dots, he, he used some real, <laughs> some real blunt, ugly words towards them, right? How do you feel about his assessment and why it's so important that we connect the dots with Egypt? Because ancient Egypt is our um, the best age, the most powerful age of black history is ancient Egypt. And every person of African heritage needs to know that. And I, and I, and I, and I get it, you know, um, every person of African heritage needs to know that. But what I'm about is a little bit different because I do go into Egypt and I go into Egypt hard. But I believe that black people of sub-Saharan African uh, uh, heritage, we have to start with sub-Saharan Africa. When we can show that we built stuff in, in sub-Saharan Africa, then we can claim the, uh, what, what was in Africa before the Arabs took over North Africa. Do you see? Uh, and a lot of black scholars try to argue it the other way around. You can't argue it the other way around. If, if, if you're going to say that your ancestors built the pyramids, you have to show, well, what did you do in sub-Saharan Africa that shows that you had the technology to build the pyramids? Do you see? And I have got that data. And that's why whenever I introduce African history, we're going to start sub-Saharan first. We're going, to, we're going to get people on the same page of that first. Once we've got that, then we can go after um, pre-Arab North Africa, which indeed is black um, history. And you've also got pre-Arab Middle East. That's also black history. But we have to start where we have to start. Do you see? Yes. Um, how successful have you been for presenting what you present today? And, and, and are people receiving it? Uh, people love it because... Um, in London, the, the black population, uh, we have, a, I mean, I'm Jamaican heritage, but we've got people, Jamaican heritage, Nigerian heritage, Kenyan heritage, and a lot of people are seeing themselves uh, in the history for the first time. Um, and, you know, so you'll get people that are from Kenya, from Tanzania, places like Lamu, they've been to Lamu, but they didn't have a context to put the history and heritage into, do you see? Um, and that's been really, really good. So the, 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 the result has been positive. Uh, people are liking what we do and people are getting a lot out of the course that we're offering. Um, can you speak about when you challenged the British Museum 
about some of the misinformation that it was articulating? Oh, uh, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. Um, no, that was all oh, right. I'm so sorry. I, I, no, no, no. Right. I can see how the story got around that that was me, but that wasn't me. Um, there's a, 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 an elder in our community called Arthur Torrington, and all Arthur right. Torrington is uh, a very well respected elder. And he's quite prepared to challenge, uh, you know, for example, the British Museum, um, their, their view is uh, ain't, when they talk about African history and heritage, they studiously do not include Egypt. And um, Arthur Torrington has challenged that and he brought me along as kind of moral support. So that was that wasn't my project. That was his. Um, and then we have all the museums, such as there's a museum called the Petrie Museum of Egyptian Archaeology. And they're coming around to the view that Egypt was indeed Black African. Um, and they, so in other words, they're, they're, they're receptive to people like me um, teaching there and that kind of thing. Why is it, a, why is it in, the, in the modern era we still have any serious questions about Egypt? In reference to trying to prove, I mean, we know the. Let me answer. Let me answer. Let me answer. The, the main, the, the, the main issue is, and um, uh, I have to challenge the African American scholars on this because why are you all debating this? I mean, there's websites. There, there are people um, writing books trying to break down the word chemic. Papers discussing the word chemic, KMT. What does it mean? Nonsense. I thought that had been settled in 1974 by Diop and uh, Obenga and all that kind of stuff. And the result is the books that you all should have produced on ancient Egypt, you haven't produced because you're discussing what does one particular word translate as. You've got um, teams debating this back and forth. It's almost like a kind of hip hop um, battle rap where scholars are doing it. Nonsense. <laughs> and the result then is, um, I'm not being disrespectful, but I have to tell it like it is. African American scholars who could have led in this, because you guys had the head start. You, you know, you 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 brought over Diop in '86. Um, Thanks to John Henry Clark, right? Yeah, uh, and so basically, um, you, you guys had the Portland model baseline essays, 1987. There should have been tons of books on ancient Egyptian history and all the other African civilizations that you all should have produced during that period. Instead, we're getting battle rap stuff over what does one word mean? And I have and I'm not in it, you know. Robin, let's speak about that because you're talking about something that's very profound and deep, and I have to just go deep in it. We know that Dia. Along with his his um his partner, this um among scholarly um scientists and I guess historians and what have you all this, and debated about Egyptians being black and they request to put the mummy, and then extract the melon to prove that they were melanated people, African, black, what have you. And it brings me back to what you just said. Why are we still having these discussions after historically been proven? Yeah, so what happens is, is you end up with scholars just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. No one's produced a book. So in other words, if I wanted to read uh, 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 a book on ancient Egypt laying out its history, its architecture, its religion, its sciences and technologies, its literature, I can't read anything by an African-American because you guys haven't written that. What you've written is, what does the word chemic mean? Yet the quality of the African-American intellects is so high that they could have produced this stuff and they could have produced it at adult level. They could have produced it at juvenile level. They could have produced it at children's level. Do you see? And could have just cornered the entire market. But that unfortunately didn't happen. And so, unfortunately, that's where I come in because that, that's, the, that's what I'm going after because nobody else is doing it. As I said, um, I've got the market to myself. 
Um, every, everyone's interested in African history until I talk about sub-Saharan Africa. No one, no one wants to go there except me. <laughs> mm. Interesting, interesting. Um, when, 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 when just looking at um, your, your journey, your walk of just really trying to figure all this out, you came to this conclusion um, by way of, of, of just understanding what you're seeing to be somewhat of missteps, um, a misguided direction, and then now you, you envision putting together a platform where we can learn. Um, how, how daunting that was as a task how has it crossed over to your fellow comrades, um, associates, and do they receive what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's working out quite well. Um, a, a lot of my former students are publishing. Uh, a okay. lot of my former students are putting books out. Um, and the result is we're starting to develop an intellectual scene in London and we're starting to change the game. So we're now producing literature that meets, um, in Britain, we have something called the national curriculum. We're starting to produce literature that meets the national curriculum. And therefore, we're starting to get to a position where we can put black history, real black history in the school system. And we're actually making those kinds of moves now. And that's something that's happened over the last 10 years. So um, the impact is starting to be there. And hopefully we will inspire other people to do likewise. In other words, the promise that the Portland model baseline essays in 1987 did, we're starting to fulfill that promise, but we're doing it in London. And we're doing it in the other English um, cities as well. I have to um, address the elephant in the room because um, I, I know that this is a, a big problem in our community. One say one thing, others say something else. And what are we dealing with? Historians, black historians understanding what's going on, black owned groups, um, different grassroots organizations, um, in a nutshell, does, it, does that work? Isn't that work against us as far as keeping us divided when we can't come in single mind? I understand that we are different, but do that keep us divided? My position is this. Um, once you know the, the history it's actually something that can be used to unify all of us. Uh, I think you sent me something about some of the names that people use to call themselves uh, among, in African America. So you've got people calling themselves Moors. That's a legitimate term. At one time in history, we were called Moors. Uh, another time in our history, we were called Ethiopians. Another time in our history, we were called Sudan, Sudanese. Another time in our history, we were called Zenj. Another time in our history, we were called Black. Another time in our history, we were called Negroes. And when you put all of that together, you end up with a very big history. See, that's, that's what I do that nobody else does. I put it all together. So for me, the history of the Moors and what they did in Spain and Portugal, that's a part of Black history. I teach that. What the what the Greeks called ancient Ethiopians and what they did in the Middle East, you know, that the, the civilizations of what we today call um, uh, Sumer and Elam on a modern map, Iraq and Iran, those used to be black nations. They, the Greeks tell us that the people in those places were Ethiopians. Um, what uh, the Arabs called Sudan, black, um, their name for West Africa was Sudan. That's why West African architecture is called Western Sudanic. Um, we put that history together. Uh, I mentioned the East Africans being called Zenj. We put that history together. What I do is I bring it all together so that it's one coherent story. 
And I put it together in such a way that the, the information would stand up in court. So you notice when I talk about glass windows in sake of argument, um, uh, uh, Gal, I told you the archaeologist that found it, what year he found it, which museum the stuff was in. Do you see? So that in every case, you can, you've got complete confidence that you can go back and check. And it will check out. And that's the way I put the information together. So at no point am I asking people, believe me. You'll notice that when I talked about Louis Binga, the, the spy that went through Congo, not Congo, went through the, the, uh, uh, the, the lands of Mossi and the lands of Kong, and I showed his images. Those were his images. They weren't mine. Those were his images. And that's the way I do it. So that way there's nothing to discuss. And so you can pull up Louis Binger's report and you can check, are those images there? They're there. Well, I want to thank this great brother for coming on, Robin Walker, a.k.a. the Black History Man. Um, he's offering a Black History course on the screen. At the bottom of the screen is a ticker going across www.blacksecret.co.uk. Um, you can sign up $35 um, pound and a special, what the special is on, Robin? Uh, for In dollars, it's $20. $20 in dollars. Yeah. And, um, and if you missed this, please catch the re um, replay of this broadcast. Um, Robin had really shared so much information and I'm, I'm really kind of peeling the layers because there are some more questions for you too, Rob. <laughs> I'm, I'm really trying to put layers, and I want you all going to go through the comments before we um, leave. Please have the questions prepared and have intelligent questions, and, and no question is stupid. When I say intelligent questions, don't mean you have to be a brainiac, a super smart. Just think about what concerns you the most about what you know versus what you don't know or what have been shared with you that you bring in a question or whatnot. Uh, whether it's false or, or, or true or what have you. Um, but I want to thank everybody. Please like and share this live. Um, we're having a beautiful live. Um, Robin, um, you said something about also black business. Um, is that a part of the course too? Yes, yes. Um, the, the business modules aren't online yet, but they will be. Okay. Uh, and yeah, because I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in entrepreneurship. Uh, but if people want to be an affiliate right now and start selling the program again, once you join it, there's an affiliate links. And if you if you if you if you if you if you're already skilled as an affiliate marketer and you want to make some money, the option exists right now. Oh, wow, I got to imagine that. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, of of, of course. I, I'm definitely going to well promote it. I would definitely um um try my best. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, it, it's amazing. Like I told in the intro, like, I knew about Robin before, and Jim Lee even told me about Robin, just checking his videos out. And you got to remember, you got that, 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 that accent like we have in the States here, the UK accent. And, you know, and Jim Lee sent me a book about um, black, successful black people in UK, you know. So I was very naive until I met her, met her about UK, blacks in UK. But when I was checking you out, we just stood out. I mean, I mean the videos, the interviews, and you know, you was great at the presentation as we already seen. And um, I, I was pretty much flattered. So when I had the opportunity to have you on the platform, of course, I took advantage of it. But um, it, it's amazing how you put this together, right? And, 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 and we have a time now like never before. We don't have to just the, 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 the educate us. We complain about that. We know that miseducate us. Our children, um, um, the museums, or what have you, different stuff that that that's not by our people, by them, and how they pitch, push out to us what's our history, who our leaders, and so forth. Wrong. Robin's offering it at a very affordable price. We spend money on so much of nonsense that have nothing to do with our growth, and I have to commend you, Robin, and um. Knowing you taking on such a feat in my eyes, right? Um, how can we, when we teach our kids what you're teaching us, 
make this fun for them to learn about the how history. It seems like they've been on a black shelf for so long. I think as soon as people read a book or two, they think they know everything, right? Can you explain how we can make this fun and teaching our kids? Because as we learn, we're supposed to pass it on to them. Okay. Um, as a former school teacher, I used to be a school teacher. Um, one of the things that I've learned, uh, and it's a very important thing that people need to get their head around, is that when you're teaching uh, children, you've got to make it age appropriate. Right? You've got to look at it from their perspective, and you've got to look at it from their perspective of what they value, because they may not value what you value. You've got to remember they're children. They're not adults. Second thing is um, when you're teaching children, you've got to teach them the age-appropriate historical skills. You see, uh, you know the kind of thing that a lot of us used to teach back in the day? Did you know a black man invented the traffic lights? That is not skills-based knowledge. So you've got to teach them how to understand sources, how to critique a source, how to look for bias in a source, how to put two sources together to tell a particular point, how to write in different ways. Um, so when you're writing about history, uh, some of what you write has got to be in letter form. Some of what you write has got to be in report form, has got to be in newspaper journalism type form, uh, uh, a play between two or three people. And all of these skills in being able to present the information, you've got to make sure that you put it like that. So what's happened is, is um, just to give you an example, uh, one of my colleagues is a gentleman called Tony Warner, um, has just written a, a high school book um, called, uh, uh, which schools are now using, uh, called Migrations to Britain. And the book is not completely black. It's one quarter black, one quarter Asian, one quarter Jewish, and one quarter all the other ethnicities that make up Britain. But it's, it's, it's written for a high school exam. And what the book teaches is all the historical skills. So no one can't say the skills aren't there. And those are very, very important. You see, one of the reasons why teachers will reject certain information, they'll say, but you haven't put it in a, in a format that meets all the historical skill building. You see, many of us, we want young people to have the content, and that's good. But the content by itself, A, has to be age appropriate, and B, if you want to get it into the schools, you have to engage with the skills um, that a young historian would have to learn at their age group. And th this is what I, I tell people. And um, putting information together where we can use it in schools. I have written that kind of material as well. I just haven't presented that today. A couple more questions, Rob. A couple more questions. Let's address the elephant in the room about how history has been rewrote, um, how valuable information has been destroyed, and how a lot of time, and I know I'm going a little bit into, into like psychology and mental health and all this stuff here, but um, let's talk about a lot of time we go regurgitate things we say, what we think, how we pray, what we believe in. That's not really of us, of somebody else reshaping our mind, training us to be something that we really should not be, like going against the order, and as a result have made us um, self-destructive in so many ways counterproductive and so forth so on. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Um, there's the great psychologist, Franz Fanon. Um, he did a book called Black Skins, White Masks, 1952, where he breaks this down exactly. And he's the beginning, what the scholars call radical black psychology. And then after him, you had people like um, Dr. Naeem Akbar, who did the book Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery. Um, you had uh, uh, people like Bobby Wright talking about menticide. Um, you've got people like Amos Wilson, the falsification of African consciousness. And they've all been developing this idea of how by giving people wrong information on one hand and by manipulating people's emotions on the other hand, you can put people into states of amnesia and delusion and then that makes them easier to control 
because they now don't have their own identity because they, the amnesia, according to Amos Wilson, is where you lose your um, pre-trauma identity. And that's what's happened to us as a people. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, so I agree that that's what happens. And the only way you can get that identity back is when you master your history, you see. Um, lastly, I'm looking for questions. Do y'all have any questions for Robin? Do y'all have any questions, please? I see a bunch of comments, a lot of positive comments. Um, my last question, can you explain and break down the difference between Afrocentricity and Eurocentricity, if you want to. Definitely, yeah. Um, everything that Europeans do in terms of intellectual engagement, everything they do um, is basically designed to further and advance their power. Mm. So if they put information into the public domain, it's to inform their own people, this is what we want you to know. And we want you to know this because you knowing this helps us maintain power. And the result is um, you can lie about information. You can misrepresent information. You can give people the truth, but put it in the wrong context. And if you give people the truth and you put it in the wrong context, um, you've, you, you've misled them. They can't do anything with the information. And these are all the techniques that people use to stay in power. Now, what Afrocentricity was about, it was an idea of Professor Malefi Asante that we need to counter that by making sure we have our own data in history, our own data in psychology, our own data in sociology, our own data in economics. And then in the other areas as well, um, mathematics, science, religion, and so on. And that's why I rate the Portland Model Baseline essay so highly, because they attempted to do that. And then my work is a continuation of that, do you see? So that way we're producing our own body of information that counters the Eurocentric body of information. Thank you so, so much, Robin, for coming on. Please support what he's trying to do for our people. Um, he's actually trying to teach about our history, not their history, but our history. And, and, and at www.blacksecret.co.uk is where you can go sign up. And there is a discount along with the fact that um, I don't believe we, I don't know if we realized what he was saying about at the time that Diop Clark Jackson, um, Dr. Ben, um, and a lot of other great historians was doing what they were doing, going against um, what was common in the eyes of how um, Europe was writing, writing history and what have you. That now there's technology and stuff that's so advanced that 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 really kind of bridged the gap of what they was presenting and showing to us to be true and listening to um, this great historian, Robin, he's actually, um, he actually put in a whole um, nutshell and made it more simple, easy. And as he say, uh, pictures, um, of course, research and all this, we have to support. I'm so sick and tired of, we sensationalizing a lot of things that we have no control over. A lot of time we start some and they get knocked down quick as the power that be sees before we come in. And a lot of time we understand this is more of an intelligent fight than anything, you know. And um what you're doing, Robin, I appreciate it. You gotta come back, man. You you gotta do this because I think that this is you on to something real, real big. Like just the history thing is big and then doing the black business, but it's so much information I know you have for us. So um can you give your you can share your last words? on what people can reach you at, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. First of all, thank you very much, sir, for uh, uh, bringing me onto your show. I do appreciate it. I hope I gave you value that you can use. Um, and for people listening, I hope I gave you value that, again, you can use. And if you consider that this is what we've been able to do in about one hour, one and a half hours, something like that, imagine if I was able to be your tutor 
and give you 20 hours worth of content, 40 hours worth of content, 60 hours worth of content, do you see? And that's what the Black Secret is all about. So if it's something that you're interested in, check us out, www.theblacksecret.co.uk. And if you want to contact me, write to the site. You know, I think it's info at blacksecret.co.uk. Um, so check us out. And thank you very much for having me on your show, sir. And, and please support because he's a melanated brother. And we always talk about buy black and support black business. We need supporters. I'm, I'm just so tired, Robert, of us complaining, whining, finger burning. And when we do find a sister or brother that's doing something sincere, that they're putting the words, that, that got the stripes, that's really doing the work, support it. And too many times we live in contradiction. We speak double tongue. We'll say one thing and then say another thing and don't even support um, what we see to be great for us as a people. You can't hang around. Um, there's comments, you know, and what have you. Hang around for the comments if you want. You, know, you want to hang around for the comments? Yes, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all right, all right. Okay, cool. All right, all right, all right. Okay, okay. Jennifer Grill. High major and found blessings and peace, strength being most important. Grand Rising family, um, Sebastian, um, Shalom, all praise to the most high. Thank you, on um, major, and salute, sir. And Jimberly, greetings, family. Greetings, Robin, looking forward to the presentation. Greetings to Robin Walker. Good day, fire. I wonder, 100 Black Real acts. I wonder would change the name Nubia to Sedan. And it, I, I, he made a comment, but it's, it's a question. He was saying, why did he change Nubia to, um, Nubia to Sedan? Um, all the term Sudan means is land of the blacks. That's all it means. Uh, Nubia, no one seems to know what Nubia originally meant. No one seems to know. There's a theory that it's the Egyptian word Nub, which means gold, uh, land of gold. Do you see? But the, the changeover to Sudan is that's what the Arabs have always called it. And the result is the Arab name is the one that's stuck, unfortunately, you know. Mm. Jennifer said, this is beautiful. They changed all our architecture. And you can comment if you want to comment in between the comments or what have you. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And they've changed it to such an extent that um, we didn't know we had any. <laughs> right. Yeah, we didn't know we had any. We, what we thought is uh, there's, some, there's some in Egypt and that's it. <laughs> you know? We didn't know we had any. I hate to say this, but I have to, I mean, agree with you, like, wholeheartedly. I remember watching Tarzan, you know what I'm saying, in the 70s. Yeah. And mm -hmm. how you had this white man beating on his chest on him. I mean, it's funny thinking about it, but it's sad how his brain was believing, you know, a white man hitting everybody behind the follow. And it would trip you out from every religion, because, you know, from your whole witness, Baptist would have, you know, you always seen some kind of white deity or, or something emulating Jesus that was white, you know. So it, it was just such a a strong mystification, even when you watch movies, you know, in Hollywood you see maids as black people and butlers. And, and it was just it was just a tragedy, the disrespect, you know what I'm saying, along with the misinformation that just is 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 really mind boggling when I just think about our experience growing up being even to all this. And Jim Lee, yes, we are feeling the knowledge. Yes, we are. Now, thanks for that. So that means they were melting metals back then. Wow. That's a question. So yeah, let, me that. That. let me answer that. Um, there's an African-American scholar called T. Faraku. No, T. Faraku Farah. Yeah 
who's written a book called uh, uh, African Pre-Colonial Technology. I might have his name wrong. I might have the title of the book wrong. He says that there's a debate among scholars around which of three different African sites was the first place in the world to smelt iron. You see, not did Africans smelt iron first, it's which of three sites, and he's debating which one, do you see? Mm. So the origins of iron smelting technology is either one place in Central Africa, another place in Central Africa, or another place in West Africa, one of the three. Take your pick. Mm. <laughs> oh. Shining Light 333, Sebastian Long made the TV and guest Sir Robin Walker chat this morning. Thank you for coming through. And Jill, they come back. So, so we did not um, go into Africa and find mud huts. <laughs> True. <laughs> and that was that was one of the lies. Great Club says, such great news of black excellence. Facts. And Jim Lee said, there is a channel in the UK called History Debunked who said the, the barbers were not black. You familiar with that channel? No, I have. I'm not. But uh, let me say something about that. The term Berber refers to two groups of people. One is East Africans and the other is North Africans. The ones in East Africa are the ones I'm talking about. They definitely were black. The, the, what they meant by the term Berbers are people of Somalia. Do you see? Mm. And everyone knows people of Somalians are black. Now, the Berbers of North Africa, um, it's controversial. And it's controversial because they're the same group of people as the Moors. And there are a lot of white scholars that want to make them um, uh, non-black because that way they can explain how those same people entered Spain, built the cities of Cordova, built the cities of Seville, do you see? And they think it's, well, it's no, no, it's no loss to us because the people that conquered us were white. That's what they want to think. We could debate that, but that's, a, that's another discussion. And, Lim, and, and Jim Lee say, Luma is in Kenya, a very historical city. Can you speak about that? Yeah, Lamu, Lamu. I've been, I've been there, I've been there. It, it's, it's beautiful. Um, it's, uh, and it's a very strange experience actually, because you're, you're walking through medieval streets and you can tell they're medieval and you've got black kids coming out to play, you know, and in this medieval environment, very beautiful city, very impressive city. I'm glad I went there to see it. Geneva, we definitely need books on this, our history. This is why they keep us down distracted and poor. Mm. And if people want a book on it, when we ruled. And if you want a course on it, the black secret. Yeah. <laughs> and also, I, 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 I said it earlier, but I'm going to say uh, right now, in description of, of, of this video, there are all the successful books that um, Robin had wrote. Please support. I, I bought a couple of them. I'm waiting on a few Blacks and Science Volume 1, very good book. I, I won't have questions about that, but it have been long and long and long. I got When We Rule, the study guy, but I plan on getting the book as well. But you have books too. We had we didn't advertise that book. Please go buy them books, you know. Study um, him uh, as a historian, um, as, as, as an intellect, and somebody who's trying to bring the truth. So definitely support all the books he got. I mean, I, I want to ask you a question about the rise and fall of Black Wall Street too. It was, a few questions I want to ask, but I, I haven't got around to it. But um, I got some books coming in, and next time I guess we can do that. Um, brother J Zachariah, the message of peace, brother Major, historian Rob Walker, and the line with Dr. Ben Jokahana, I believe, Dr. John Henry Clark, and Dr. Francis Creston Wilson. We have to love and appreciate our black historians, B1, FB. And um, BP. 
Um, thank you very much, Zachariah. No, no, thank you very much. Shining light, see, they sabotage our history. Yes, yes, yes. I thought they hit your graphics were only in Egypt. This confirmed the written Egyptians were black. I have a question on top of that. Yes, sir. Why you didn't connect Ethiopia? Uh, I, I'm going to ask that question because you probably did because I, I was doing a couple things while you were doing your presentation. But why do people, I, I've read this, that the, the parents or the mother of Egypt was Ethiopia. And I don't know why history just disregarded that early on there were so many examples of Ethiopia influence in Egypt. And I don't know why, even though it's written and you already know why they don't want to connect the two, they just want to keep them separate. Uh, for reasons of propaganda, that's why. For reasons of propaganda. Um, the reason why I didn't go there is, you know, I said before I was presenting what's new. Um, and because I'm presenting what's new, people already know that. Do you see? Ben Yochan had already said that. John Jackson already said that. Ivan Van Sertima already said that. So I'm presenting what's new. Okay, 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 okay. Major, thank you. Major, you are so on point with your channel. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming through, sister. Nina Cole, how you doing, Nina? Knowledgeable information. Yes, yes, yes. Salute Major TV for real report and black power. I'm just doing my part. I'm just doing my part. Michaela Dawson, salute Major. Tune in. So late, but good to see this. Yes, yes. Shadi H was in with Sadie. Excuse me, Sadie said, powerful information. Yes, yes, yes. Ophelia, thank you for all the information. Powerful. Yes, yes. Ray Cloud said, thank you so much, Sir Robin Walker, for bringing our history back to light. I'm going to stop right there because that's perfect. I, I really believe after hearing your presentation, your response to questions that I asked, that you really really um, for bringing our history to light in a sense, whereas the things you know to be controversial, you stayed away from, right? Or if you talked about it, you gave more of a clear reason why we shouldn't be discussing and keep talking about Kemet, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and what it mean and what have you. And at the same time, you have technology on your side, you know what I'm saying? You have the modern doing your side, so it does give you definitely a, um, a big push as opposed to our old historians and whatnot, but that's powerful you say that, Bridge Club. I agree that you have to look at the history of sub Sahara Africa before going to Egypt. Now, I have to go back to this because I'm glad you said that. Can you explain briefly? I know you had said that, but can you reiterate briefly why that has to happen? Here's why. Uh, we're living in a world where you've got white supremacists, alt-rightists, and so on. And if we step incorrectly when we deal with the history, they're going to be all over it. And what happens is, is a lot of black scholars make the mistake of trying to claim ancient Egypt without showing uh, what sub-Saharan Africa has produced. And it looks like we're trying to claim history that's not ours because we don't have any history. Do you see? That's the impression it gives. I'm not saying we're doing that, but that's the impression it gives. And the way to counter that impression is, let me give you an example. If you look at something like Karnak in Egypt, how grand, how impressive Karnak is, people will say, but Robin, you have to admit there's nothing in sub-Saharan Africa as good as that. My answer is, yes, there is. Um, the city in Ethiopia, Lalibela. You know, in Lalibela, the Ethiopians drilled a city out of the ground. So all the churches are underground. That is as grand a technological achievement as Karnak. And that shows that if we could do that, we could do this. Do you see? Yes. If you look at, 
if you look at the um, castles, I sh the castles and the cathedrals I showed you, especially the cathedrals, the ones in Nubia with glass windows, if we could do that, then you could argue that we could build Karnak. And that's the point that I'm trying to show. Um, if you look at the houses in Lamu, um, I showed you the houses in Lamu with their whitewashed walls, their beds, their, you know what I'm saying? That's grander than anything in ancient Egypt. Yes. You showed me an ancient Egyptian house as good as that. Hmm. And so consequently, now there's no argument. You see, the reason why nobody doubts that white people built ancient Greece is because we can look at the cathedrals that white people have built since then. And if they could build those cathedrals, then logically they could build ancient Greece. Do you see? Right. Well, you actually doing what um, Chad N. Diop has said um, we should do as black historians, right? So you actually making sure you connect the dot, you know, with, with the Saharan, um, sub-Saharan um, Africa, with Egypt. Okay, cool. I, it, 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 when she said it, I kind of had to think, I'm like, let's 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 go back and revisit that because the people need to hear this. Cause I won't lie, people be saying they know their history, but they, they have no idea of <laughs> how vast and broad it is, right? And we don't really how disconnected we are with reality once we're not as in tune, you know. Um so, right, so, so I can I interrupt you? Can I interrupt you one minute, sir? Yeah. As right. I said, you know, you've got my study guide. Yeah. Do the first 15 days of the reading. And then invite me back onto your show again. And then you'll find out what 90% of people who open their mouths don't know. 15 days worth of reading. That's it. I promise. I promise. I got to get the book. I, I want to buy the wrong book. The study guys. I'm going mm -hmm. to definitely mm -hmm. do that. I'm going to definitely yeah. do that. I promise. Um, Shine Light said, all praise be the most high. Yahweh, Elohim. He is bringing down these strongholds that have played it part in converting our people. Knowledge is power. Understand is wisdom. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, too. Geneva, yes, Robin. Mr. Robin Walker, thank you for this knowledge. It's very important for us. Facts, facts. Where, as far as land, is the most opportunity for us to gather and live and peace to regain power? Mm. Um, that's a serious question. Um, Very serious. <laughs> this is the problem. You see, um, for those of us that have been through slavery, um, the people that put us through slavery were very careful to make sure that we own no significant land after slavery. Do you see? So the countries that are today controlled by black people are just some rocks off the, the coast of Central America. No substantial land mass. And yeah, I mean, it is something that we're going to have to address at some point. And in other countries where there is substantial land mass, we're not the majority. And we're you know, drowned out numerically by all the groups of people. I, I know, and, and, and I, I won't lie, and I ought to be, I, I'm, I'm going to answer that to the best of my ability. When you are the powerless, you know, doing something like that, you have to have a real underground movement like you're seeing, you like to see um, with other, or with other um, nationalities that was, that, that, that was in certain situations and whatnot, you know what I'm saying? And I was gonna call a few that came to my mind, you know. Um, but people don't really understand what state China was in, you understand what state on um, the Jew was in, you understand the state that um Japanese was in Germany, what have you. And when you study these countries and how um they wage war other ways, but you, you can't just make moves without strategizing properly and without getting some kind of power and strength. And you gotta realize, even though Germany um, lost in World War II, they 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 um have, have waged war on other areas, you know. And, and you see the common thread I'm saying with Japan, even with China. And out of them, I think China probably flourished the more, right? In reference to the manufacturing, what have you. And we just have to understand. See, our people are sensationalized by when we see people with guns, black people with guns, and talking that rah rah, and we don't be realizing that. When they watching us, 
they watching everything we do up until, you know what I'm saying? We do the wrong thing. And you know what they do? They kill us or lock us up. So too much time we do too much of running our mouth in front of the camera. And too many times we don't observe history and, and, and watch how our ancestors made mistakes or, or, or missed moments. And a, a lot of time I, I think we just don't understand that when you're talking about stuff like that, look, we seen what happened to Malakaya and uh, in Georgia, you know, what they did him and stuff. So when God landed with that, it's just not that simple. You know, when you look at what happened with Castro, you know what I'm saying, and Cuba and what have you. You understand this is this is it's next level type talk. So it, it, you can get land, you can do all that, but when you got somebody that 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 that's oppressor or, or, or determined to keep his foot on you, you know you have to be um, constant. In the fact that you have to know how to move and you have to build gradually. And too many times we're looking for that overnight thing to happen or that black messiah, some aliens coming here, you know, and you know. And, too many times we put all the faith in God, you know, like you know, like we really think God gave us the tools and blah blah blah. So I don't I don't want to go over to all my opinions about this then. I just feel like too many times rely on a lot of things that that's in my opinion is not a real reality in reference to us really just sit down and, and just ask these real questions and, and, and really like you explained about um over in the states, how black historians are just—they could have capitalized and they didn't, right? So for me, I just feel like until we able to understand that we already been given the tools, we do have the abilities. See, too many times we don't realize the reason why we don't have a lot of things happening not because of systemic issues, because the way how we've been trained and taught to think. You know what I'm saying? So until we overcome that, you know, getting land all that is great, you know, and people are doing it. But if you don't have power, some kind of influence, you don't have some kind of way of, you know, like give yourself a wiggle room to kind of like gradually grow and be strong. It's hard to really sustain something against on um, governments that's trying to, you know, subjugate you. You know, so. true say, true say. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of comments. Too. Uh, a lot, a lot of comments. I'm sorry, I'm skipping through y'all comments. Um, Ask me, say it was a good question. I got a couple questions for you too, Robbins. That got texted me. Um, I want to try to get these, give them respect. They've been waiting a, a while. I'm trying to see. This is also great in Zimbabwe. If we can go even for the south and i think she's just saying that if we were to even talk more about that it'll bring out some more information yes yes we don't really have all the time <laughs> in the world okay um, thank y'all for your comments um i can't cover all comments we've been on here almost two hours but i've had a couple questions how do historians um do their research and find the information um, to make it come to certain conclusions about their assessment on something. I mean, how do historians do it? Yeah, how research-wise, you know, how y'all come to these conclusions and whatnot. And this someone was texting me, you know, that I'm asking because I didn't have a chance to ask. I'm still going to do your comments, but I, I want to, like, I don't know, take up all the time with just going bounce through. A few. I, mean, I really would like to see questions and stuff, but I'm loving y'all comments. Thank y'all so much. But I, we need to kind of like keep it pushing. All right. Ben Yokanen says, all you need is two things, the facts and the documents. That's it. Yeah. I go further. You also need to make sure the reasoning is tight. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So I would say facts, documentation, and tight reasoning. Um, and once you've got that, no argument. There's nothing to discuss. So um, um, I said, for example, that, you know, there's a, a, a rough, a, a Kenyan edition of the rough guide, you know, rough guide to Kenya. And it said that the, 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 the structures in Gedi had bathroom, toilets and bidets. My thing is, you don't agree with me. You get a copy, check out a copy of the rough guide and find out, did it say that? Do you see? 
So there's yeah. now to discuss. Either it said it or it didn't say it. And that's the way that we, we do it. So it, it's, 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 it's documents, it's, it's uh, facts, documents, and then the reasoning to make sure your reasoning is tight. Um, sometimes someone could produce something, but their reasoning isn't tight. But just because their reasoning isn't tight doesn't mean we can't use it. It just means we have to tighten the reasoning as well. Um, and so what I present then, I don't present anything that's controversial. I really don't. I mean, it sounds controversial to people that don't know. But as you can see, you know, I've, I've, I scan in some cases the book with a page open and point you to where it said it. Do you see? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's the way you do it. That's the way you do it. And anybody can be a historian. It's not a specialized craft. What it is is when you're dealing in an environment that we're in, where we're in a Eurocentric environment, you need to know the facts, you need to know the documents, you need to know the reasoning. You also need to know what are they saying and what are they basing it on, and you've got to know their lies better than they know their lies. Sorry, the sound's breaking up. I, I'm so sorry I see you breaking up too long. Sometimes I'm in that truth now. How much truth in the Bible about our history? And my history in general. Is that a question for me? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's that's one that's the last question I'm gonna ask. That was something that was um texted me. Um, the answer is I really don't know. I really don't know. Um, I attempted, you know, I, I've written a book called Blacks and Religion, Volume 2. In Volume that. 2, yeah, I look at um, the black history in Judaism, the black history in Christianity, the black history in Islam. And at the, the Judaism one, writing a history of Judaism is extremely difficult. You know, sometimes you'd like to say, just stick to the facts. All of the facts are disputed, all of them. And so um, when it comes to just stick to the facts, you can't really do it. You have to put your opinion on the facts. And then when you put the opinions on them, so the simple answer is, is I don't know. Um, <laughs> all I know is, um, in the case of Judaism, there really are ruins of a synagogue on Elephantine Island, uh, and that was built in the 6th or the 5th centuries BC. You know, Elephantine, the border between Egypt and Nubia. A synagogue was found there in 1909 to 1911, and I've got the synagogue report. That means there really were black Jews in antiquity, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know that according to European Jews, the oldest form of Judaism in existence is what the Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopians practice. Um, but a lot of it, as I said, I read. So answer your question, I don't know. And with Christianity, I'm a Christian. All kinds of problems. <laughs> Linda Joy, when we do build without putting our information out, there's always one in that group that turns and tells, well, man, what we doing as a nation to tear down what we are building. Mm. Appreciate the comment. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, history has reflected that, that some can't be disputed, but but you know, I believe everything lives on. Like we, we can't, for me, we can't live and feel about nothing somebody may go tell I think. Oh, no. Let me answer that. Let me answer that. All right, please do. Please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, history likes to record the sellouts that sold us out. Mm. But this is what they don't tell you. Um, in Brazil, during slavery, there was a, a group of runaway blacks, uh, people called the Maroons, and they set up their own kingdom, and their kingdom was called the Republic of Palmares. And little by little, uh, people uh, escaped and joined Palmares. 
And there's one account that says 30,000 people escaped to join Palmares. Now, why this is important is 30,000 people, all of them keeping their mouth shut. Mm. Let that sink in. Mm. They kept their mouth shut. So it is possible for people to keep their mouth shut. Mm. And Jim Lee said there are Igbo Jews in Nigeria. Uh, are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, Nigerians are made up of three big ethnic groups. Yorubas, Igbos, that's pronounced Igbo. Even though I know there's a G there, but it's pronounced Igbo. Igbo. Yorubas, Igbos, and Hausas. And the theory that the Igbos are Jews um, goes back to the 18th century. There was a scholar called Oluda Equiano. You, know, you, you may have heard of him, Oluda Equiano, famous slave from the 18th century. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He said that his people were originally Jews. And he was saying this in the 18th century. I think Dr. Bensi was a Jew as well, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the idea then that of there being Igbo Jews, um, uh, as I said, um, that discussion has been happen happening for uh, for the last two, three hundred years. Right. Um, I, I won't. I, this this has nothing to do with. Well, I'm. We we deal with color, like, colorization thing, right? Well, mm -hmm. you never see in Israel, you know, like black Jews. You always see white Jews, just like. When you look at um, um Caribbean, excuse me, you look at um Latino or whatever, when you look at the media, it's always something somebody real fair skinned or white. Um even in China got real black or uh, age real black people. This colorization thing is a real deal, right? Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. How do that affect us too psychologically? Because I feel like as long as we not we don't see um melanated people in the forefront of elite or what have you or or in places where we know they, they're at, how does that affect our mental psyche? It does, it does, but we can challenge it. Um uh there's a woman called uh Yiddish uh I now, if I'm pronouncing her name right. Um she's a black woman that won Miss Israel in 2013. And you can Google her. Oh, right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, so it is possible, you know, for, you know, a black person to get that kind of position. Yeah. Well, right. uh, is, is that if you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. Right, right, right. And um, really, Club, it wasn't like you asked the wrong question. You said my positive question, what I gather, we really think we can do secretly as a whole without the white man. It's sad to see. Um, Knowing you are sadly mistaken, he has trapped, he tapped your phone. You're missing my point, brother. It, I'm not saying you can't buy land and build. I'm just saying that it's, it's bigger than just buying land. You know, I'm just, look, people have bought land. You know, I'm not saying it. I'm just saying, well, I'm going to show you fences. Rams were talking about um, taking over cities in Detroit. You know, and I, I talk about um, Melikaya because he bought land, and look what happened to him. And you know, so my thing is, and even Ramsey even said it. You know, he's the African now. He said that we were talking about going back to Africa. He said a lot of um, places in Africa is colonized, or you know, is on a pre on colonialism and following the West and and, and and China and what have you. So I don't want you to think like I'm saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that the way it look wherever. Melanated people at they have infiltrated, they have they have taken over, they have control. So you know, I don't want you to think like like I'm trying to debate you. I'm just saying that it's no running away from what we're dealing with. We can go anywhere on the globe, there's no running away from everywhere you go, you're gonna see conquerors or oppressors that have some kind of influence on these different governments and whatnot. And those who are not under the influence, um those who are not under influence um, are definitely treated very, very bad with sanctions and whatnot, and uh, 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 just not recognized. 
So, you know, I, I don't want – there's a big thing about us buying land, right? And and I, I get it. But we talking about moving our people to a certain place, but we can't really we, – we can't even protect ourselves over here. Not long gone somewhere over there. And I, I'm, I'm just trying to just make us think about it. It's all about scratch. I'm not worried about tapping no phones, what have you. I'm talking about just strategizing. You know, and I'm just saying it's other people that have been in situations. I know our situation is more there because of the trial we went through um, with slavery and how they conquered Africa and whatnot. I just feel like we just have to think in too many times. We, we sin before our own eyes. You know what I'm saying? What they're doing is we speak out. They just convicted um, on fourth the Grandmaster J for standing up. And people all messed up and woo woo woo. You are in a society that's not gonna let a, 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 a melanated person speak up, especially with guns and open the eyes of our people. And I don't understand, like, we really think it's just that easy. And I I, and I suggest to you all just go watch Attica and documentary in the prison break what they did them. I seen it twice, just seen it. And they show you how they went and shot the white prison guards plus the um plus the um prison guards. I mean plus the um, plus the prisoners and then ask for certain people that were speaking on camera and killed them. And then howl on the video, white power, white power, because they was hollering power, black power, whatever. We don't understand the wickedness and the evilness that we're dealing with from a people that don't look at us same as them. So I just, I just had to say that because I, I don't want Bridge club, nobody think like we can't do it. Like you do whatever you want to do, but if you don't, if it's not well planned and you don't look at down the line what's going on, you know, you're gonna fall in that trap. So yeah. This is coming, time is coming in, what have you. So let's see. Here's the thing now. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to get off the, I'm gonna have to jump. Okay, right, cool, cool, man. Come cool, on, I'm about to get off too. It's cool. Well, thank you, Robin, so much, man. Really, really appreciate you. I kind of bounce through comments. I didn't mean to keep it that long, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure, sir. And thanks to everybody. Hope uh, people got value out of it. And in which case, thank you very much. I'm out, yeah? No problem, man. <laughs> All right, big respect, sir. All right, likewise. For everyone else, I, I really appreciate um, the energy. Um, I really appreciate... Um, the comments and just people tuning in. Um, and I'm gonna call you after the live, Ray. We can get an understanding or well, you don't misunderstand what I was trying to say. For everybody else, y'all don't got nothing but love for y'all, but you know we gotta go. And I'm gonna just ask y'all to do this be strong, be safe, be small, and just be you. Peace. Let's talk. Yeah. Doing it from the hook, that's the only way of doing it. Giving the proof of talk, cause these jewels are real jewelry. Remember, we used to march for peace. The days of Dr. King, remember, we would walk the streets showing our unity. Yeah, strength in numbers, we need to talk among us. We need to show more love and be more supportive. Product of my environment, something wrong with the soil. Soldier with no platoon, cause every day it's a walk. Doing it from the hook, that's the only way of doing it. Giving the proof of talk, cause these jewels are real jewelry. Remember, we used to march for peace. The days of Dr. King, remember, we would walk the Street showing our unity, doing it from the hook. That's the only way of doing it. Giving the proof of thought, cause these jewels are real jewelry. Remember, we used to march for peace. The days of Dr. King, remember, we would walk the street showing our unity. Let's talk. I ain't saying that it gotta happen overnight, but we gotta make a change to preserve life. Serve a greater purpose to start with you and I. Gotta plant the seeds of hope deep in your mind and let it grow to something you never thought it would. And give back all the blessings to the neighborhood just the way you should. The only way to do it. This is major TV music, black media. Doing it from the hook, that's the only way of doing it. Giving the food for talk, cause these jewels are real jewelry. Remember, we used to march for peace. The days of Dr. King, remember, we would walk the streets showing our unity. Doing it from the hook, that's the only way of doing it. Giving the food for talk, cause these jewels are real jewelry. Remember, we used to march for peace. The days of Dr. King, remember, we would walk the streets showing our unity. The Negro is still languished in the corners of American society. Finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition.